Ukraine, Israel, Russia, Syria, Iran. There is no shortage of trouble spots on the radar screen of Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs. And he joins us now to discuss those difficult files. Here's John Baird, also the MP for Ottawa West Nepean, fighting a cold, but glad to have you in that chair. Good to be here. Let's talk about Ukraine, since it's so hot right now, and I gather much of your day today is going to be occupied by that. What have you got planned today? Well, I'll be sitting down with uh, some senior leaders in the Ukrainian community, uh, meeting, with, uh, meeting with others to talk about uh, how we can work together with our uh, friends and allies and how we can calibrate, uh, effectively calibrate our response to, uh, to what's transpiring across the country. Do you really have more plans to help the opposition over there? You know, I think what we've got to do is first work with uh, like-minded allies and uh, the two biggest ones are obviously the European Union, uh, which is a tremendous force for good in the world, but particularly in that part of the world, uh, and the United States. Um, you know, Switzerland as well, obviously, for, uh, for banking regulations. Mm -hmm. So uh, working with like-minded allies, we, uh, our, our ambassadors on the ground are regularly in uh, to see the minister, even the prime minister. Uh, we are uh, obviously uh, in close touch with my counterparts. Uh, we brought in a visa ban on some of the, uh, the worst offenders and uh, looking what we can do to engage, not just with the government, but as well with uh, the opposition. When you heard that uh, Mr. Yanukovych is quote-unquote on sick leave, what did you infer from that? You know, that's funny. The immediate thing I thought about was uh, when Gorbachev went on sick leave when uh, just before during the coup that took place in uh, 1991. So it was like a, a flashback. Uh, so uh, we'll see. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's more. This is more than about one person. It's about really a direction that the country will take. Will it either uh, look to the West to prosperity, democracy, freedom, or will it look to uh, to its east? Uh, which has uh, been uh, an unpleasant experience uh, in the past 50 years. I hear you. Let me follow up just uh, as it relates to Russia on this issue, because I, I gather Canada and Russia are going to have to kind of increasingly cooperate over what happens in the far north. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the government of Canada continues to urge Ukraine to look further west, as opposed to make some kind of rapprochement with Russia, whether that will affect whatever plans we may have in the north. You know, listen, we, uh, we have a uh, uh, varied and complex relationship uh, with the Russian Federation. Uh, the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, is uh, smart, uh, he's tough, he's effective, but uh, uh, we can uh, cooperate and work uh, together, asserting Canadian sovereignty in the Arctic. Uh, but we can also have, you know, meaningful differences of opinion on Ukraine, on human rights and the like. So it will not affect Canada's direct national interest vis-a-vis -vis the North well, if we go against you know, Russia on this My issue. job is to stand up for Canadian values and to stand up for Canadian interests, and often uh, they're competing, but uh, we can't sit by and, uh, and not speak out and not be active on the streets of Cave and across the country with what's going on there. Uh, this is against our national interest, uh, what's uh, going on there, and uh, it's against our values, and that's why we've been uh, so outspoken and active uh, on the ground. Our ambassadors uh, one of the two or three key players, I think, in uh, the diplomatic community there, and uh, we're uh, we're anxious to uh, assert, to continue to assert those values, and to collaborate both with the government uh, and with the opposition. I was there last month. I met with both uh, the three opposition leaders and uh, the foreign minister, and uh, obviously uh, outlined uh, outlined our perspective. How do those meetings work? Um, <clears throat> the foreign minister, they're traditionally much more formal. Uh, you sit down across uh, across a boardroom table, and what language do you deal in? Uh, English, George, normally. They speak English too? Yes. And do you listen or do you tell? I think you do both. I mean, I think what I did is I said, listen, uh, here are our concerns. Give me your perspective. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, you have a back and forth. Uh, you know, obviously I laid out specific, uh, specific examples of things that concerned us. Uh, the lack of democratic space, uh, the violence, the lack of independent investigations into uh, the violence. Uh, you also encourage them uh, to try to seek some sort of meaningful collaboration with uh, the opposition. Um, you know, listen, I mean, it's, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you, you uh, don't necessarily accept everything you hear, but... Uh, but I wonder if you think they're really listening to you and care about what you say, or if they're just humoring you. Well, listen, I, I, I spoke to my counterpart last week. I specifically raised our concerns with this new draconian law uh, with respect to, uh, you know, freedom and assembly. Um, you know, he gave me his government's position. I gave a strong, uh, leveled some strong concerns that Canada had. had. You know, five days later, they made uh, major changes, uh, repealing, you know, nine out of the uh, 14 or 15 odd provisions. Do you think you so, had an impact on I that? I don't know. I mean, you, you can only hope that uh, uh, together, working with like-minded allies, we have some uh, we have some impact. What, are, what is having an impact are the people in the streets. 
I visited the Maiden last month and talked to uh, the men, women, students who were uh, uh, protesting. Uh, this is a pretty, uh, it was a pretty, uh, uh, you know, mainstream group of people. Uh, it wasn't all students. You had seniors, you had uh, middle class folks, urban, rural, uh, some uh, Ukrainians from uh, diasporas abroad. Uh, but I was pretty impressed to hear their voices and what their aspirations are for the country. Ukraine is facing some major, major challenges. I mean, they've got their energy crisis, they've got uh, fiscal crisis, they've got uh, you know just their capacity to be able to uh, to pay the government bills. Uh, obviously, the uh, the political uh, crisis is the most significant, uh, where the president's got 15 months, and obviously, like most leaders of government, uh, they uh, are doing all they can to uh, to stay in power and to be reelected. Mm -hmm. Shall we talk Middle East? Sure. Uh, Prime Minister Harper will celebrate his eighth anniversary as Prime Minister <clears throat> next month, uh, a week away, roughly a week away. And I guess a lot of people are asking why the Prime Minister made his trip to the Middle East only now. What's well, the answer to that? I think he was, uh, had, a, had, a visit, had a visit scheduled uh, a number of years ago, uh, but uh, the then Prime Minister Omer uh, was uh, facing some um, pretty significant challenges that led to his uh, departure uh, from office. It's uh, the Israeli Prime Minister. Absolutely. We, um, you know, we engage regularly. I know the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has visited Ottawa on a number of occasions. Uh, we end up seeing uh, these leaders uh, you know, all the time on the sidelines of international forums. Um, I've been to Israel as foreign minister five times, so we have a, a strong relationship there, as we I think have a strong relationship uh, with just about every country in the region. And well, let me ask about that, because uh, obviously everybody has observed that the government of Canada's position vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East right now is more tilted towards Israel than it ever has been in the past in this country. And I But increasingly, Saudi Arabia's position is more tilted towards the Israeli view, uh, whether it's on Iran, uh, whether it's on for, Hezbollah, for different reasons. whether it's on Syria, yeah. whether it's on uh, the political upheaval okay. in Egypt. But, but the question no, 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 is this is a fundamental, this is fun, a fundamental point. Uh, yeah. I think our position, Israel's position, Bahrain's position, the UAE position, the Saudi position, uh, are, uh, are very similar on many, many issues in the region. Not the Palestinian problem. Not on the Palestinian question, no. Right. Okay, so, but let me ask you this. How much heat do you take from the Arab community in Canada, the Muslim community internationally, the Arab countries in the region, because of where Canada now stands vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East? I, we, Canada has, I think this is a probably uh, an historic high for our relationship uh, in the Arab world. Uh, I have great friends and, and, uh, and professional relationships uh, with a lot of the Arab foreign ministers. This is not, uh, I have received more questions for you on our position on Israel than I have from any Arab so leader we, in three years on the job as foreign minister. Uh, we have wait, a fundamental- Say that again? You, you've got- You have raised more questions with me here today than I have had from any Arab leader or any Arab foreign minister with respect to our position in Israel. They don't ask about this it? This is a bigger issue for the Canadian media than it is uh, in the Arab world. Yeah, we're a sovereign government. We have a significant difference of opinion on one issue. What we don't have a difference of opinion on, opinion on is we support a two-state solution. Uh, we're working hard with uh, uh, the uh, Palestinian Authority uh, to um, help them be able to, uh, to build institutions uh, for a future state. And we have good relations uh, with the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the Palestinian foreign minister was in Canada, called me a friend, uh, said uh, Canada worked very well with the Palestinian Authority. No media would cover that. And uh, that's a reality we have to deal with. It's a far bigger issue among the media in Canada than it is among Arab leaders uh, in the region. I, I, I'm, I'm not raising it because it's an issue with me. I'm raising it because I hear about it out there and I just wanted to get your view sure. on it. So do you, you're not hearing from Arab leaders that, in their view, you're tilted too closely to Israel. I, I don't, it just doesn't, it rarely comes up. So this country has not paid a price for that tilt? I don't believe so, no. Uh, people know in the Arab world uh, where we stand. They also know that we're incredibly engaged uh, with the, the Palestinian Authority. We had a $300 million aid program to help build the Palestinian security and justice uh, and capacity to police uh, themselves. It's one of the best uh, foreign development uh, programs that we've uh, ever run. It's had meaningful, meaningful uh, impacts. Last year, first time there was no uh, Israelis killed in a terrorist attack. Uh, I think President Abbas uh, deserves a lot of credit. Uh, President Prime Minister uh, Fayyad, the former Prime Minister, did a fantastic job with respect to uh, uh, to a building structure of a future state in uh, in the West Bank, uh, building uh, an economy and economic growth. Uh, the Prime Minister announced 66 million dollars of uh, development assistance um, to uh, the uh, to the Palestinians. Uh, those are all things that will help uh, you know increase prosperity and uh, and the capacity. Uh, of uh, Palestinians to build a future state. Okay, let me ask you one more thing about Israel and then we'll, we'll move on to uh, Russia. 
A lot of people are genuinely curious about this Prime Minister's commitment to Israel, which as everybody acknowledges, he may be the most pro-Israeli head of government in the Western world. He may be. And everybody's looking for reasons why. And I just say, I mean, you know him and you understand the policy, obviously, and I wonder how much of that is rooted in his very honest, deep, evangelical Christian faith. How do you say he's an evangelical Christian? I don't know. How do you know? People who are on the trip tell me. No, but in terms of his, uh, in terms of his, you say he's a Christian evangelical. I don't know uh, what church he worships at. I certainly sitting side by side with him uh, in Ottawa for the last eight years. You don't. Uh, it's not something uh, that he wears on his sleeve. Right. I think we support Israel. It's the only liberal democracy in the region. Uh, you know, uh, the Jewish people only have one state. Uh, we saw why it's so important uh, for the Jewish people to have a, a state, uh, whether it was uh, the Holocaust in the middle of the last century. Uh, let me tell you a story. I was in, um, I was in uh, Jerusalem and I was with a friend. We met some uh, IDF soldiers and this friend of mine recognized uh, a family friend, the son of a family friend. They had uh, immigrated to Israel and made Aliyah from Israel. Um, the, two years before, and he was doing his uh, three years in the IDF, and he said, "Well, what made you? What made you? You know, come to uh, Jerusalem? Is it, you looking for a job? Was it the economic situation?" And he said, "No, he had been uh, beaten senseless by a pack of anti-Semitic, uh, uh, you know, gangs, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the violence and the concerns that they had in that part of France where they lived uh, were such that uh, they didn't feel safe, and that's why we need a Jewish state, uh, one Jewish state, so that." Uh, uh, you know, people have, uh, people have a home, people have uh, uh, a place to uh, seek uh, refuge. Uh, we've seen far too much in the history of uh, mankind uh, of anti-Semitism and even violent expressions uh, of that. We saw what manifested itself in the middle of the last century and we profoundly believe uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the need for, uh, for a Jewish state. You know, the, the great struggle of our generation is uh, the, the struggle against international terrorism and far too often uh, the Jewish people and uh, the state of Israel are on the front lines of that struggle and uh, we, uh, we believe they need support. Uh, I, I don't know that he's an evangelical Christian and, and you say you don't know either. Uh, it may be that people have inferred that because I think he's the first head of government ever in Israel's existence to visit the western wall of the Temple Mount and pray there. And people may have come to conclusions as a result of that. That's an historic visit by a politician of of any country well, I've, ever. I've, I've seen pictures of Barack Obama there. Not I've as seen, president. Uh, well, I mean, whether it's... No, that's the point. Uh, whether they came a, a year before, a year after, uh, you know, I know... Well, that uh, matters. Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, was there about a month before uh, uh, we were there. I mean, this is, uh, you know, to... to I'm not being I've, critical. No, I'm just pointing visited, it out. No, but I've visited Israel. I've uh, visited... Uh, uh, I visited the Al-Aqsa Mosque, I have uh, visited the Church of the Nativity, and I visited the Western Wall. Uh, these are all meaningful... Uh, You're not the Prime Minister. He's the PM, and he went there. I, uh, I uh, think uh, you're reading more into it. Okay. Let's move on. Russia. The games start soon. How safe do you think our athletes will be over there? You know, obviously we, uh, we uh, are concerned when you have any major event. You know, Canada hosted the G8, the G20. We were concerned about security. We saw what happened in Atlanta. Uh, we saw what happened in Munich. We naturally should be uh, concerned. I talked about the great struggle of our generation. We've seen some terrorist incidents in other parts uh, of the country. Uh, I know Russia is doing all they can uh, to uh, ensure the games are safe, but uh, obviously people should register uh, on travel.gc.ca. Uh, they should be vigilant and, uh, and uh, have their wits about them. Uh, so American athletes have told their families not to go to the games. Would you make the same admonition to Canadian athletes? You know, I think I'll let people make their own judgments. Uh, I mean, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, you've got to be careful uh, nowadays. Uh, we'll have, obviously, uh, consular officials on the ground uh, to, uh, to provide assistance in the event something happens, but uh, let's, uh, these games should be about the athletes and uh, their achievement. Lots of attention, of course, to the anti-gay law passed in Russia. And uh, you told us earlier that you had a kind of a, a deep but potentially complicated relationship with the Russian foreign minister, your counterpart. Has that law been a, a point of departure, a point of difficulty between our country and theirs? Yeah, absolutely. We've, I've you know, raised uh, the strong concerns, not just the government of Canada, but more importantly, the people of Canada, uh, directly to Sergei Lavrov, my uh, counterpart. Uh, this causes us a great concern. 
I think where we have some departure with others is that, yeah, we're concerned obviously about athletes at the games, but we can't be selfish. I mean, these are a few thousand people for two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, the real tragedy is the, uh, is the millions of Russians who've got to live under this law each and every day. So how do you further show your <clears throat> unhappiness to that injustice? I think we're, we, uh, uh, Canada was the first uh, major Western country to speak out. Uh, the United States, the United Kingdom uh, joined us in uh, condemning the law. Uh, when it was uh, going through the Russian Parliament from the day it was first tabled, uh, we intervened on uh, nine separate occasions uh, to level our concerns. We thought it was important uh, to do it quietly at first to try to be effective, but when, they, when uh, the President made the decision to sign it into law, uh, we've obviously been one of its uh, most vocal critics. Syria. Minister, do you see any hope for reconciliation among the warring factions in Syria? It's very bleak. Uh, I attended the, uh, the meetings in Montreux uh, last week where some 30 or 40 uh, different countries got together with a number of international institutions. Uh, our special representative, uh, Brahimi, for both the UN and the Arab League, uh, has done ex kind of extraordinary efforts, as Kofi Annan has, uh, to try to find a resolution. The challenge we have is we can't even get um, accepted norms and accepted international uh, obligations for humanitarian assistance. Um, you know, where people are being, uh, you know, trying to be starved out yeah. of particular neighborhoods in Homs and Hama, uh, you know, as two examples. Um, and now the Al-Qaeda affiliates who are working in, uh, in the parts of the country are now following Assad's lead and doing the same thing. Uh, so it's obviously uh, deeply troubling. Um, we have played a major role on the humanitarian side. Uh, not just to, uh, to international organizations and responding to the uh, UN's appeal. Uh, the World Food Program is doing phenomenal work there. Uh, Valerie Amos' humanitarian uh, organization at the UN is doing phenomenal work there. We've also tried to do work uh, directly with uh, Jordan, uh, which we're concerned, uh, you know, is, is facing gigantic pressures. It's like almost 20% of their population now are, um, are uh, Syrian refugees. And the kind of uh, challenges that that's putting to um, that's putting to uh, you know on their education system on their health system mm -hmm. um, there's the big refugee camps but there's also uh, there's no visa requirements so there's you know uh, there's uh, Syrians staying at friends and with family uh, throughout the country uh, we're working with uh, you know what can we do in, in Lebanon uh, with respect to the school system because you've just got so many Syrian mm -hmm. children uh, so uh, we're looking at uh, what we can do with the UN on that as well what about weapons you know the Americans have decided to send some Hellfire missiles into the <clears throat> opposition in Syria. Is that something Canada might sign on to? No. You know, I, I've, um, I, I don't mind uh, the consideration of the use of force as a, as a diplomatic, uh, something in our diplomatic arsenal. I've always felt that the more the opposition is armed, the, uh, uh, the, the, greater, uh, the greater violence that the state is used. And unfortunately, that's proven to be, we said that uh, two years ago, and uh, that, has come, uh, that has come to pass. I mean, the moment uh, the opposition becomes better armed, Assad just gets more brutal and tougher and more people are killed. Um, I don't think this is going to be won militarily. It's got to be a, a political uh, solution. And that's why the work that uh, uh, Secretary Kerry and, uh, and Special Envoy, uh, uh, the UN and Arab League Special Envoy is so, so important. Is Canada involved at all in John Kerry's efforts to bring peace to the Middle East? Yeah, listen, we try to do uh, our part. Uh, I think providing, uh, providing uh, humanitarian and economic development support uh, to, uh, to the Palestinian people is important. Canada, I mean, he came up with a fast start, $100 million plan uh, to jumpstart a lot of economic growth. Canada was the first country uh, to step up to the plate. Was he giving you a job of any kind? Not, not at this stage, not uh, but on a number of times we've been uh, asked to be helpful here and there, and obviously the answer is we'll do everything we can. We um, are also supporting the quartet. Uh, it, uh, it, Tony it Blair's has, group? Tony Blair's group has a very important role to play. Um, we think economic development is tremendously important, as long as it supplements the political process mm -hmm. and not replaces it, and uh, uh, that's tremendously important. Canada at one point uh, well, notionally still has the gavel for, for refugees mm -hmm. and the refugee question. Um, have, we have got to take the lead, though, uh, from the Israelis and the Palestinians on where they'd like to go on that, because obviously we're not going to go in and uh, impose uh, our, uh, our solutions to these uh, challenging problems. You're a guy who spends a lot of time on planes. You're the Minister of Foreign Affairs. You're also a politician, though, who well remembers Tip O'Neill's admonition that all politics is local. So let's follow up on that. I want to just do a few minutes with you here on all politics being local. And this got a lot of attention over here, and I don't know how much of a deal it was when you were over in the Middle East with the Prime Minister. But uh, you, your caucus colleague, Mark Adler, who's the MP for York Center, uh, when uh, the delegation was at the Western Wall, the holiest site in the 
Jewish world. And he was overheard saying, come on, I got to get in there, getting a shot with the prime minister. This is the million dollar shot. It's all about my reelection. What did you think of that comment? Listen, I wasn't there at the Western Wall. That happened. But you know that happened. I'm going to focus on the big issues, the big challenges. If I got caught up on, uh, on spending an inordinate amount of time or any time on those type of issues, uh, it would be a minute uh, not spent on dealing with the big challenges but, the world but faces. Those, I guess the question becomes, do those comments, which are really politically very cynical, not interfere with your ability to do what you do? Not at all. You don't think people come up I mean, to you afterwards like, and say, come on, what's this all about? No one's come up to me and raised it. I focus on, you know, uh, when that, uh, the, that day I was in uh, Montreux at the uh, peace negotiations with Syria. Listen, I have, you know, I have uh, 24 hours in every day and I try to put them to good use. And every minute I would spend worrying about uh, something as inconsequential as that would be a minute uh, wasted. Anybody give them hell for saying that? I was in uh, Montreux that day. I didn't. And I, I honestly haven't spent two minutes thinking about it. Okay. Uh, how about, um, you know, obviously there's a sizable Ukrainian population in Canada as well, and people who are uh, not as pure as the driven snow as you and me might suggest that the government's extra interest in this file uh, has more to do with local politics and picking up Ukrainian votes in Canada than it does with anything that we're actually able to affect over there. What you're saying? No, I, mean, that? I think Canada's been, uh, obviously we had six major waves of uh, Ukrainian immigration in our country. Um, in the West, we have uh, a Ukrainian population that's been there for, uh, in some cases, more than 100 years. In Toronto, we have a lot more recent uh, immigration. Uh, this has been something that Canada's uh, had special focus on for many, many years. But for and domestic political Brian reasons? Brian Mulroney's government was the first to, uh, to uh, recognize an yeah. independent Ukraine. Uh, this is not entirely a partisan issue. I work very closely, for example, with, uh, uh, with Ted Opitz on this issue, a conservative member of parliament uh, uh, from here in Toronto. I also work with uh, Peggy Nash. Uh, who I know this is a priority for her. She was one of our election observers. Uh, so this is, this is not a partisan issue. It's one, though, I think that, uh, that uh, we take special pride in our relationship with Ukraine. Uh, our, uh, you know, when I visited uh, the Maiden, there was a gigantic uh, uh, shell of what was to be a Christmas tree that uh, became a protest tree. And, uh, you know, uh, in, in the tree there was a Canadian flag uh, because a lot, of, uh, a lot of people in Ukraine have family uh, and uh, relatives in this country. And uh, we have a special relationship there. We, it's one of those countries uh, in CAVE, we punch above our weight. Uh, we play a bigger role than, uh, than uh, we might otherwise do, and I think we should uh, value that. It's also a responsibility uh, for us to, uh, to speak up and to, uh, and, to, uh, and to fight for what's right. Uh, we don't make uh, foreign policy decisions uh, based on uh, you know, diaspora uh, and election calculations. We base them on Canadian values and Canadian interests. Come on. I mean, not at all. You make no foreign policy judgments on the basis that domestic political issues don't play no, a factor that, that, at all? Those aren't, the, those aren't what motivates us. We fight for Canadian <laughs> interests uh, and Canadian values. Uh, and no, I grant you that, but, but to say that domestic political interests don't play any role whatsoever? No, in the, in the policy, uh, <clears throat> maybe in communications or public relations, but in, in, ha in what position we take, we don't take positions that would be against our values or against our interests just to get a vote. Understood. Uh, a minute and a half to go here. You know Hillary Clinton pretty well. She was Secretary of State as you've been Foreign Minister. Do you think she should run for President? Listen, it's not my place to get involved in, uh, Give her some advice. in American politics. Uh, I had dinner with her and some other friends uh, last month. Uh, she is smart. She is tough. Uh, I enjoyed working with her. Would she be a good President? I have no doubt she's going to run, and I have no doubt if she was uh, uh, as strong in, in the White House as she was at State, uh, she would be pretty effective. But I'm, I'm not, I don't get involved in, in those political calculations. There's going to be a strong uh, Republican uh, field, and uh, you know, I think it's in our interest to see two strong candidates for each party uh, be nominated because we want a strong uh, and effective uh, person in the White House. But you wouldn't vote for her, would you? Uh, listen, I don't. I'm, a, I'm the foreign no, minister no, of Canada. I don't endorse <laughs> candidates in other countries. I know, but you're. I think she's smart. Uh, I think she's uh, tough. Uh, she's but a you're a small city she's, Repub she's, uh, she's a friend. Uh, I'm not a Republican. I am a monarchist. You're. you're <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Very well played. You're a small C conservative, though, and if you had a vote in the states, you'd be voting Republican, and she's a Democrat. So I don't, she's I don't your endorse, friend, but you wouldn't vote for I her. I don't endorse candidates. I have a huge respect for her. Uh, Did she, she ask you at that dinner if she should run? No. She Did didn't. you tell her she should? <laughs> Come on, let's. Uh, I think I think I think she'd I think she'd be a great candidate. Uh, I enjoyed working with her. She was very positive towards uh, Canada. Um, you know, and it's it's an awkward position because you know, would you like to see a friend become president of the United States? I mean, who wouldn't? So that'd be good. And two for the price of one, right? There you go. The husband's got some experience on that file, too. 
Uh, John Baird, uh, we always appreciate it when cabinet ministers take uh, so much time, in this case, to uh, spend some time with us here at TVO. So thanks a lot for putting us in your schedule today. Thanks for having me. That's John Baird, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Canada. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.